make us, make you different to everybody else. So there's people who do care about their footprint. You know, they want um, eco-friendly, well, eco-friendly herbicides and pesticides, so organics and your battery power. So there is a marketplace there, it's trying to find that marketplace. Yes, you could probably charge a little bit more for it, but there is a market there and it makes you stand out and different. You want to put a few different things on saying what you do. But yeah, I, moving forward, battery, we're using a little bit high, very high end battery, expensive, but it works great. To build equity? Yeah, that's the question. I need more information. What, what does he mean by build equity? Because yeah, equity. Yeah. Maybe not putting there, Brad, what do you mean by more equity? But, um, yeah, because yeah, techni technically cash on a balance sheet is is piece of equity. So you can you can either do retained earnings on a balance sheet and keep the money inside the company, or you're gonna use that and deploy that capital to probably grow more in terms of marketing or hiring or equipment, et cetera. So, so read the question again. Sorry. Got it. Zero. So, what I would do, what we personally did when you're trying to maximize growth, is I'm simply looking at my personal finances and how little can I take out of the business. Every single other dollar of profit is going to stay in the company and be used towards buying more trucks, marketing, hiring, and that just. A personal preference and that was my goal was to grow really fast I think if you're gonna be more conserved with your growth pattern it's like how fast do I need to grow what when do I need to buy trucks because you can just simply like the capacity thing we used this morning if your goal is a hundred thousand a month okay great you're gonna need six trucks and you're gonna need five and seven uh, eight nine employees you're in order to get to that goal. So you can just run the math on that. And then it's just a matter of how fast you want to get there and are you willing to sacrifice the profits outside your pocket and into the business. So, and, and honestly, that comes down to the tax thing too. That's why you hire people like her. Donna. Yeah. Donna. Uh, so my question is sort of two parts. Um, so it would be right to say that you basically reverse engineered where you wanted to, where you saw yourself and you worked backwards from that. Yeah, like, um, I think everyone should do that. They shouldn't listen to someone like me, like, oh, I should grow my business. I think it's a stupid thing to do. And I, I'm afraid of that, honestly, like, sharing my stuff publicly online and stuff. Everyone's like, oh, I got to grow a million-dollar business. When I honestly believe that probably less than 20% of business owners should do that because it's just, like we talked about this morning, a different level of stress that they should not be tampering with. Um, so for me personally, yeah, I work backwards, right? Like how big of a business am I going to build? How many trucks do I need to have? How many employees does that mean I need to have? And then how much can I afford every year to put towards that? So that's where you can just, it's it, like even the battery versus fuel equation, I'm the worst person in the world to ask it because I, I literally will say like flip a coin because it doesn't matter. It's, it's the numbers. Ultimately, the customer needs their grass cut. Right, and um, most customers aren't willing to pay a whole lot more for the little things that we think are a big deal. Um, they just want their grass cut. They want it done right. They want a high level of professionalism, and I can deliver that product. So it's just, I'm much more numbers driven. I'm super unemotional about what type of equipment we use. I have no idea what type of equipment we use at like our shops. I tell our guys like just find a good dealer that's going to service you well, uh, especially if you're stupid like me and can't don't even know what a carburetor is. Like then you need to have someone smarter than you. That's so. right, mate. I don't know either. Yeah, <laughs> so. Neither do I. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, the second part of my question, um, I, I, I just, um, with the population in the US, uh, obviously it's a lot bigger, so you have a lot more employees to, to pick and choose from. How do you see that as the difference between Australia, where we don't, and you'll find that it's difficult to put on the employees on the road here, where I want my business to go to? compared to the US. Yeah, questions yeah. about US versus Australia's market. So first and foremost, we have 600,000 landscapers in the United States. So per capita, we actually have a less concentration than you all. So if you think, oh, it's, it's you know, you have more employees and laborers over there, we have a higher concentration of landscapers than compared to here, mostly due to the Hispanic population and Mexicans that do this for cheap all over the place. So. Um, so I wouldn't look at that. Like, comp competition, again, is something I do not look at. If, if you're in a market where there's lots of competition, I feel like you're right. it's the best place to be because it means that there's a market for it, and then you just got to figure out differentiation. How do you make yourself different than the other 
500 guys in your local market. Uh, in terms of employees, we that our, our average cost of living is lower. So there's a slight advantage there, but it's the same thing as here. It's the exact same stuff. Like no one wants to work outside. Young people aren't interested in the trades. Uh, everyone's being pushed towards uh, college and tech and things like that. And so it's a matter of a making it a place where when someone starts, they see a very clear path to grow inside your company. If you're just offering a frontline position, not super attractive if someone's comparing it against Apple or Google, right? But if I can say, hey, look, you're going to start at 15, 20, $25 an hour. Okay, great. Here's the steps. We're going to give you like the three years path. You're going to become a manager, an estimator. You can start your own business. And outside of that, go get something else. Go get another job. Um, and so we really push that hard because we, we don't, we aren't buying this notion. Like we're going to keep people for 10 years. It's just not realistic in this industry. How do you guys go about like uh, making sure that you've trained people adequately and cover yourself from a, a legal standpoint in terms of putting people on as, as employees? I know Jim talked to She might be the about, best for that one. I mean, yeah, Jim talked at the start about um, having a, a registered training office here and running programs and stuff like that. But until that's sort of an, an option for us, how would you guys go about doing that? Questions about training people. I'll, I'll take that. It, so if you don't feel confident that you can um, uh, itemise a, 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 uh, a, a, no, a... No, the word, word I'm looking for is uh, like a description or training for a specific each task is what I was thinking of. If you don't feel confident you can break that down and then um, mitigate the, the risks involved in that, there are companies out there that will basically... Um, create a, um, a document for every single task that you have within your business and um, to the point where, yeah, they'll do all your contracts and the documents that you would then take your new employees through to make sure that they understand it, they sign off that they understand that task and which will then cover you. So there is a lot of employment um, companies out there like HR companies that will help you do that. You gotta um, pay for it. I might just add to that a little bit about what I did. Um, so um, I was from McDonald's before I um, before I came here. And at McDonald's we had uh, performance reviews yearly, but we also had this thing called TMS catch-ups, which we do it every three months um, to make sure that the performance level of our employees is where it needs to be and, and they're uh, getting trained to the certain standard. Um, and then, you know, you'd come back three months later and you'd do the review and you'd say, hey, are you at this point yet? This is where we said you would be at. Um, and so in my business, I, I put that in uh, in place. And so we I do TMS catch-ups in my business as well as performance reviews. And so what I'll do is I'll say, all right, right now you're at this point. In three months, you should be an expert to be able to mow a lawn. And then what I'll do is I'll make sure, I'll go actually go out with them and make sure that they can mow a lawn efficiently um, to an expert level uh, and do it obviously safely. safely. Obviously, I provide all the PPE, uniforms, all the rest of it. Um, and then I'll do that as they progress through the ranks. So. I do, yeah, th every three months uh, I do a catch up with them. And do you document all that? Yeah, it's all written, yeah, and it goes into their file. So I've got a file in the, in the office. Um, yeah. So every, every team has catch up and performance review is, uh, we have exactly a description of what we've talked about and what we've, uh, what we've evaluate, evaluated them on. Yeah, I saw you mentioned, Dan, you used metrics for KPIs for your people. Can you tell us a bit more about those? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so uh, the the question there is, uh, uh, can you tell me a bit a bit more about the metrics of, or KPIs and how I um, how I evaluate with KPIs? So again, this is something that I, I brought from McDonald's. Um, so we had something called sales per crew hour. Um, so at McDonald's, uh, sales per crew hour, we wanted to run at 120 sales per per person on the floor. Um, and so it's exactly the same thing. Um, the whole reason this $2 minute thing came about was because I wanted to achieve $120 uh, an hour. Per, per employee the same way that McDonald's did. Um, so I would um, quote for that about for how I could do the job and then see if my staff could do it. And then I got to the point where I was quicker than that and I was able to do regular jobs at $2.50 a minute 
and then my staff should get to the point where they can at least do it at two dollars a minute. So that was one of the KPIs that I had there. Another one is I had a, uh, you know, when uh, at, at McDonald's they have reaction times. So you've got to put the bun in the toaster in a certain amount of time. You got to have uh, you get the bun out of the trolley and put it into the toaster within five seconds. So what I did is I went, all right, well we've got to get out of the car and grab the brush cutter from the back of the car within five seconds. So you'd pull up, park brake, uh, park on, handbrake, keys out, jump out, try and grab the brush cutter. And so you try and do it within five seconds, so you're not sitting in the car. And the whole point was to alleviate uh, people looking at their social media while they're still in the car or still playing their Pokemon. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, th those were a few things that I did, yeah. Uh, Jim was Make up this for the RTO for that dog, for dog grooming and exactly. But if there's a course they can tailor from, they can actually get registered and buy the shirt and let it do. That will do it. That's the plan. Uh, if I could just add about the KPIs real quick for everyone just to have an actual number, like a, a, a quick one. I know we had talked about the budget hours versus clocked hours before, but an easier number for everyone, so you, in case you don't use budget hours, would just be total revenue per, for that employee divided by their clocked hours for that day. That's going to give you an effective hourly rate. And if you track that over time, you'll get the average for your for a, a team member and see who's highest and lowest performing. That's just like the easiest track of, because it includes drive time, it includes unload time, it doesn't just include the dollar per minute on the job site. I've got a question for from online. Brad, do you have any advice or information for someone looking into sponsorships, additional cost and employment responsibilities? Uh, so does it mean sponsorship for overseas employees? I would say that. Yeah, uh, no, not they have changed that. It's a it's a quite a timely process to get through. I've got one client currently going through that and has been doing it so far all this year, and has outlaid probably close to fifteen thousand dollars and still doesn't have that employee here. So it is a very expensive way of doing it, um, and I feel like there's probably better ways in order to get a an employee. Cheap, much cheaper options out there still. Like yourself, John, you went to eight employees, or what was your max? Stan would have been similar to eight. Yep. Uh, why, what stopped you from going further, let's say, to 20 or the 15? I've never heard of a mowing franchise that you had at, say, 12 or more. Was it just, you didn't want the headaches, or why didn't you go? Okay, we, did, we did go a little bit higher late last year, but we found that the clients that we were attracting probably weren't fitting our brief. They were a bit low and we needed a bit more dollars, so we had to split those customers off and we dropped it back down a bit. We just, yeah, we couldn't find enough commercial or the, the more profitable type job or the bigger job moving to too many houses wasn't for us. So we, had to, we found that we just scaled the business back a bit. That's not to say that now We've developed some other stuff that we may actually increase it a bit again, but I do have a franchise region to look after now, so I'm not going to grow my business too much more. Yeah. It's only so much I can do. Um, well, for me on that, um, so what was stopping me or what was slowing me down? down? Nothing. Nothing. I could have kept going. Uh, well and truly could have kept going with the system that I had where I'd bring on 80 new regular customers. Um, and put another employee on to, to look after those customers. So um, I, I, I decided to stop myself. Um, I was getting to the point where we were um, doing, you know, $24,000 weeks uh, towards the end. Um, I decided to stop myself because I could see that my two daughters had more, uh, had more of a connection with my wife than what they did me. And I wanted to be able to spend more time with my two girls. So, you know, uh, once they grow up, who knows, I might go do it again and, and go even bigger. But there was nothing at all I could have kept going. 
and, and like when we when we look at a lot of companies when they grow really quickly, set six to eight thousand, six to eight hundred thousand. I don't know where you guys are in terms of revenue, but like that's a very natural stop, stopping point for growth a lot of times, and a good place to stop because when you start getting above eight, ten employees, like if you just look at like the military, etc., they won't have more than eight to ten people reporting to one person. And so when you get that many employees reporting to one person, you you almost or need and start needing an, uh, another admin or non-revenue producing employee to be in the business if you're going to scale past that. So we like encourage our franchisees if you're going to go above eight hundred thousand, you almost have to go to like one point five to make it worth it. Because if I'm going to go hire someone for let's say a hundred thousand dollars a year on salary um, because they're a general manager, high level type position, well, if I'm running a twenty percent margin business, I need to produce five hundred thousand in revenue just to cover their wages. So if I'm going to go go up to eight hundred thousand in revenue, managing up myself, but if I'm gonna go get beyond that, typically I need another person and they're gonna be a high level general manager. I'm gonna pay them 100 grand, great. You're gonna to have to grow to 1.3 before you make a single extra dollar in profit. And so um, that's that's something that we see as a natural stopping point for, us, for one person to be able to manage. Well, so the other question I have is about, uh, you said you know how to service codes my catalog. Could have in service codes with you. So, do you think a franchise agent could scale quicker if they just, let's say, cut back to three or four service codes only? You know, if someone says, Oh, can you do this? They say, No, we can't do it. Or that's, is that sort of a barrier to scale you see just having all that many services? Yeah, like, so if you want to scale fast, adding services is the way to do it, right? The more service you offer, the more revenue you can do. And especially in gyms because you all don't do as much of your own marketing. If, I, if you were saying, hey, you're driving all of your marketing, and then I would say just focus on one service because all your marketing dollars can go towards that one thing and you can specialize in it. Um, but I would say if you're trying to grow, probably take everything you can get at gyms, but just realize that that's an unprofitable way to do it, right? If you're doing everything from paver patios to artificial turf to installing new sod and soil, uh, and then you're going to expect the guy to mow a lawn, like it's extremely difficult to find that labor, train that labor, and then make it efficient and not expect the complaints to be rolling in um, at a very high level. If you're doing like when I talk about a lot of stuff I'm talking about, I'm talking about like we try to make two or three new locations that I own and never show up at, I, like it has to run on systems and simplicity, right? So when I talk about that, it's not necessarily what you have to do if you're an independent owner operator there all the time to manage. You talk about taking services out. It's, it's defining what your business is. So if you're doing artificial turf or landscaping or turf laying or things like that, we can't do that. We're a maintenance driven business. So that's what our business is, maintenance. Landscaping, someone else does it because we just can't squeeze in enough time, <coughs> pardon me, to service the customer to that maintenance need. So we have to, we just don't take the work. Another thing, if I could re really quickly add, sorry, I know that the whiteboard has been overused today, but um, one thing that is no, sometimes overused, mate. <laughs> one thing that's important, especially with mowing, but almost all our home improvement industries, is like you kind of have a spring rush. And then things kind of slow down. Like this is kind of like the natural demand curve of what we ha we go through. So this might be like three months out of the year that are really busy. I think for you it's like September, October, November. Is that like your crazy time? Uh, yeah. Spring rush kind of thing. So what we do sp specifically um, is we will only accept mowing customers and recurring maintenance during about this window of time. But then if someone asks for a project-based job, we will say, yes, we are booked out five months and we will book them out during this time of the year. So that's an opportunity as well. Um, just to balance out somewhat more your demand so there's not as much of a crazy spring rush. So. Yeah, our franchise is always called banking a job. Yep. Yes, yeah, squirrel. But you've got to be careful if you're banking a job on a brand new customer that you've just quoted because mostly they'll go to someone else. It's got to be your regular customers. You're banking those jobs. So it, look, for us, we, I start thinking about winter. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> um, I've been talking all day. I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, we we start banking jobs. Start thinking about winter and how we're going to plan winter in March. So for winter for us, it's for it's always been our busiest time. We get massive growth in winter, and we're really steady and we're full. And come towards the end of winter, I start to panic that we're not going to get through it. And then I dislike spring because it's just crazy busy 
and you can't control it as much and you're really running around a bit like a headless took sometimes trying to stay on top of everything whereas winter you start planning I call it squirrelling away because that's what the person who taught me about this yeah and winter and we're up 30% on last winter this year and it's good gardening profitable work in the business um, I, I don't bank jobs at all. I just thought I'd put that out there. Never once have I ever thought about doing that. I do, always do the job straight away as soon as I possibly can. And if I need more work through throughout winter, I will mark it like crazy. I won't stop. So I, I will never bank a job. Yeah, I've lost a few jobs because <coughs> I banked them. And then I just paid it off. They weren't regulars. They were after a gardener. Mm. And they were happy to bank the job, but then they stopped responding, etc. And I lost quote jobs that I could have done because my franchise law had suggested to bank and just concentrate on the market right now. Um, and yeah, so I lost those ones. And so then in hindsight, some of those ones where they're not regular, I'm not seeing them every month in those touch points. I've just gone, you know what, I've got opportunity to do you on the weekend, I'll get that done. And then build and build and build on that customer and condition them that hey, I do have time for you, but it will be at the end of the week or it will be the next month's calendar, etc. But you don't know unless you're really getting that feel point from that customer. You can't do it with new customers. Yeah. <clears throat> it's got to be regulars. But let's say you've had regulars going on for three or four years. Yeah. You're nearly doing winter pruning without them even... They're not even asking. It's because they're so used to you doing it in the winter. Yeah. So, and there comes spring... So I never understand why we get this influx in spring. Everyone on the first sunny day starts wanting to get all the garden, they go to Bunnings, they go everywhere. Wouldn't you want to do it in the middle of winter and the first 20 degree day, you're sitting on your deck at about half past three, over in a nice cold, putting a barbie on on a Saturday and enjoying yourself yeah. instead of in the rat race of the world. So, but once you get that customer up and running, it's hard to, you can't bank the new ones, but you just program. It's more not banking, it's programming when the work's being done. So you get this nice smooth amount. Yeah. yeah. I, I did a, a, instead of Christmas and July special, I did a spring and July special for some of my customers and said like 40% off green waste, I don't know what my green waste price is. And so it's already high anyway. And I've got all these jobs, they're like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Get my spring stuff done now. And I know it's going to go one foot on their preposterums in spring at any rate, so at least I'm getting in early and then I can come back to them with, oh, let's make that nice enough in spring as well. So just getting that extra work out of it. Yeah, if you come to banking jobs too, we will not put a job on the schedule if they don't pay for it. So if they're going to book out four months from now, we'll say, great, we'll put you on the schedule as soon as you pay for it. So even if it's a $10,000 project, we'll yeah. make that happen. Full payment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My question on that. What made you go down the employment path as opposed to splits, and have you done splits? Uh, so for me, um, splits are usually, if you're splitting with territory, you usually split for eight times cut value. Um, but that's on average, I believe. Um, I would rather go do that property eight times and keep that customer and continue to do them. So that's why I won't do splits. My honest answer, my first employee fell on my lap. A guy with 30 years experience left his job, who was my best mate, and I thought, hello, why would I not do this? This guy's, I don't know nothing, and I've gone, we haven't got enough work, but who cares? This opportunity is never going to arise. And that's how the business just evolved, which is a sheer accident. Yep. Just in the right place at the right time. What motivates you, mate? Because you're 26 years old, you've got 100 bankers already. Obviously, once you retire, you probably could, so I'm going to get out. So, what motivates you, and where are you? What's your vision for yourself and your business in, let's say, 15, let's say, 20 years? What do you hope to be doing with your brand? You know what you're going to be doing in 15 or 20 years? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so, like, our. our, our my ultimate goal for Augusta is we do want to go public eventually. So um, we have a bunch of software, web design, um, tech that we're working on, and then along with the franchising, we in 20 years, like 2040, we want to go public. Um, but you know, in terms of motivation, like I think it's 
there's no right or wrong way to grow your business. I think it's a matter of like work your way backwards. It's so important. Like you cannot come to an event like this and be like, I'm gonna build a million dollar business. No, like, do you want a million dollar business? Is it gonna serve you well? Is it gonna be good for your family? Like, that's really important. Like, I don't have a girlfriend, I don't do anything on the weekend, I don't spend time with family, I don't do any of that stuff. I work out and I work, that's it. And so if that's not gonna serve you well, then you shouldn't do it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, I, I'm a big fan of being out of balance. So, um, like, if you want to make progress, like, if you're trying to run, you're constantly out of balance in order to run. In order to make progress, I feel like you have to have some sort of out of balance. And so some of you might be judged for that, especially at the beginning couple of years of your business. And it's, it's normal because you're trying to grow a business. Like, that's not a normal, doesn't fall in your lap. You have to get out of balance for a couple of years to grow a business. And then, you know, in five, ten years, you might talk to me and I have a family and I'm like, Forget work. I'll work 10 hours a week and just spend time with my family. And I'll be completely out of balance that direction, right? So I'm a big believer if, I, if you want to make quick, fast action uh, and progress, you got to get out of balance. And so um, that's you know, the story of my you life. You have to <clears throat> gotta come out of your comfort zone. It's going to be hard work. You're going to push. You're going to work. Why is, it <clears throat> why is it when people work really hard, people go, you work too hard? If I went down to the, you played golf and he played every day and he got down to scratch. Did anyone ever say to you, "What are you? Stop playing golf, mate. You're going to kill yourself." Unfortunately, so yeah, no some people. That. Some people did. <laughs> but when you go to work Obviously, and you push yeah. yourself hard, yeah, yeah. they go, "You're working too hard." Right. Oh, hang on. Do I have, so if I'm going to the golf course every day, what? That's not work, right. or that's not pushing myself to the limit. So we have this society has this funny way of thinking about what work is. And you talk about what motivates you, success. But what is success? It's not necessarily monetary value. It's building something that you're really proud of. The money is just, that's just something that's the end goal. It's, I, don't, you don't, I don't really think about it. It's, I'm building something that's successful that can carry on for another generation maybe. That my son can take over, he's 23 years of age. So that will be for me success. Okay, so yeah, but don't be afraid. People will, but you're gonna have to throw yourself out of balance, huge amounts, if you're gonna employ people, because you're gonna have to go and do quotes and all sorts of things outside of ours and work like a lunatic. And people will say to you, you work too hard. And I don't get that, because if you are endeavoring in your sport or whatever, they never question that. It's a strange philosophy society. Well, I, I was talking with the media team, because they're like the highlight of the show today. And I was talking to um, Greg specifically, because he wants to start, you don't mind me saying this, do you? He wants to start his own franchise and so and, and what she said was like super key i think and he said that the reason he what he finds is that he loves video and editing and all the rest of it because he does it as a job he doesn't no longer enjoy it when he goes home and does it himself the thing that he used to be passionate about has become a job and so i think is which is which, which, what's really important is the fact that anything you love right now you like you wish you could do all day long and you would if you did it all day long it would become a job it'd become work Right, and so I think if you can find a business that you're so passionate about, you want to do it every single day and it doesn't seem like work, you won the game, that is success, right? In my mind, success is contentment. And so if you're content, that's not complacency, but if you're content, you've won the game. I don't care if your business is 100,000, 10,000, uh, you know, a million, 10 million, doesn't matter. If you can be content with what you have, you've won the game. You're beating 90% of people out there that just, just aren't content. That's it. If you're happy, who cares? That's it. It really is. I, I really don't think we put enough emphasis on that as human beings. If we're happy, it doesn't matter whether we're driving a Lamborghini or a Hyundai. If we're happy, we're really, we're going places. I would just like to add, not every day I'm motivated. I, uh, like, a lot of times I go into like yeah, this. what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of days I just wake up and I go, oh, God, here we go. Let's get it done. But uh, no, I, uh, I think that I have, uh, I've got myself in a rhythm. I've got a consistent rhythm that I do every day and that's what I do all day, every day. And I, I don't want to put myself out of whack with that. It feels weird if I put myself out of whack with that. So not every day am I going, I'm super motivated to do this. Like some days I'm like, screw this man, like, come on. I just want to go and have a few beers with the boys. Um, but uh, no, I, I think that I, my consistency from my rhythm of doing it every day is what keeps me going nonstop to see, you know, but obviously I do have I do have motivations that are the reason why I do it, but not every day am I chirping. I'm like, God, yeah, you know, I can't wait for this. So I just wanted to put that out there. Jesus, Mike, he needs to stop drinking Red Bulls. He's up and about every day. <laughs> <laughs> Question on 
line up in Braddy's gone. So the panel, what was your biggest hurdle with the initial hire of your first employee? Is there anything you wish you had done differently? The very first hire. No, um, no, not really, because mine was perfect. It helped me to develop my skills. Um, well, I uh, I hired my younger brother. Um, <laughs> who doesn't talk to anymore? <laughs> yeah, who I, don't, who I don't talk to anymore. So uh, I, I should have probably hired the other brother. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking around. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't talk to him all that. It wasn't because of business, though. But no, I, uh, yeah, no, that was that was probably a bit of regret there. My first employee actually like is a, actually a bit of an interesting story. So it was a friend of mine, crazy hard worker. He had moved from Idaho, which is like next state over from Washington, right? And out from the bush, he was just like a crazy hard worker. Came to work with me, um, and I offered him at the time seventeen dollars an hour was a lot in our market, right? We're talking years ago, right? Seventeen dollars an hour was a lot. Well. We start growing the first couple of years. We're starting to grow pretty quick. We have maybe three, four, five employees in that second year. And she wants to leave. And at the time, I was in that financial stress part, right? You don't have a lot of money. You're putting every single dollar back into the business. And so he's leaving, and I offered him $25 an hour. And I, I honestly don't even know how I could have afforded it. It was stupid money at the time. But I, I knew I needed him, and he was an incredible employee. Just like, could out outwork two of me? No problem. And what was so interesting, the psychology of how an, how an employee thinks, is he actually took that as an insult. Because he's like, you're going to pay me more now. Well, what about the past year and a half that I've been pay paid 17 So is it only because I'm leaving that you're going to offer me more money? I didn't even think about that. And so from then on, that's when like, P4P became so important to me. Because I'm like, he deserved more money. He worked his brains out. But I didn't have a system in place to compensate someone who did, did that compared to the guy who worked right next to him and made two dollars less an hour like he produced twice as much he deserved the money and so from that moment was when i was like if i can just figure out something around performance pay instead of dollars per hour which is so messed up like how is it how is it even fair that someone who works their brains out makes two or three dollars more per hour than the guy that just kicks along for the ride with their phone all day long like that's not fair like, and then we wonder why employees get unhappy or disillusioned or go into a job like yeah i was a I didn't have a system in place. Shame on me. So. Yeah. So thank you everyone for your attention today. This replay will will hopefully get it ready by next week, and we'll email it to everyone as well. Um, if you're wondering about Donna slides especially, please email national at gyms.net. But we'll make sure that we can get those slides and whatever's being presented up here to you as well. Thank you so much for your attention today for the first one of these. Hopefully we can do it again next year and actually have one of you guys or a couple of you guys up here talking as well. Big thanks again to all of our panel, especially Mike as well, who was our um, international guest as well. So thank you very much, guys. <laughs>